Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. And now, here is Walter Bingham. Hello and welcome to the program for the 15th of December 2020, which in the Hebrew calendar is the 29th of Kislev 5781. I am Walter Bingham, and it's my pleasure to have your company for the next hour. Today's feature item is an extensive report on the dangers of assimilation. What kings and rulers tried in vain, we are succeeding by ourselves. There's an old Yiddish saying, loosely translated, to be Jewish is not easy. That's why I have enormous admiration for those who are Jews by choice. My job as a journalist is to bring up and discuss questions that Jews should care about, and I believe that the subject of assimilation is on the mind of a large segment of Israel's population. Through the ages, there have been efforts to eliminate the Jewish people, or at best, force them to denounce their religious belief. There were times when they were enslaved, as in ancient Egypt. Jews have been abused by the Greeks under King Antiochus, who desecrated the Jewish temple, prohibited circumcision, the study of Torah and Kashrut, and the Jewish dietary laws. Then came the Romans. Following the revolt in Judea against the Roman oppression, King Titus captured Jerusalem in 70 of the Common Era and destroyed the Jewish temple, killed many Jews, and scattered the rest all over the Roman Empire to undermine their power. Jews fared no better after the emergence of the monotheist religions. Christianity is rooted in Second Temple Judaism, but Jews were amused about the claims made for Jesus, and the two religions diverged in the first century of the Christian era. In 380 of the Common Era, Theodosius decreed Christianity to be the official state religion of the Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire began to disintegrate in 476, but continued in the East as the Byzantine Empire, where Jews enjoyed a punctured tolerance. After its defeat by the Ottoman army in the 15th century, when Islam became the official religion, Jews had a period of relative prosperity. Israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world. Israel is an island of stability and a sea of war and unrest. In the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. And now, here is Walter Bingham. When Islam became the official religion, Jews had a period of relative prosperity while also suffering sporadic persecutions, arbitrary confiscations, attempted forced conversions, or pogroms initiated by the Muslim rulers. In Europe, where Christianity took hold, anti-Semitism became rampant. It was in 1190 that the Jews, who were seeking refuge in the castle tower of the city of York, in England, under the protection of King Richard I, were murdered by an angry mob because the king left to go to the Crusades. But those were not the only murders of Jews that were perpetrated in the Middle Ages. In 1492, the joint Catholic monarchs of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, issued the infamous Alhambra Edict, expelling all Jews from their territory. Fast forward to modern times. During the late 19th to early 20th century, France was rocked by an anti-Semitic scandal. 
Alfred Dreyfus, a Jewish captain in the French army, was falsely accused of passing military secrets to the Germans. Several years in prison, and after another trial, he was pardoned in 1906 and reinstated in the army. Dreyfus died in Paris in 1935. Following the discovery of the real perpetrator, Emile Zola, a prominent French literary figure, penned a letter to the French Prime Minister entitled J'accuse, but that's another story. To this very day, France is a hotbed of anti-Semitism. Persecution of Jews has been a major part of Jewish history, prompting shifting waves of refugees throughout the diaspora communities. One of the most recent initiations of Jewish persecution started in Germany, where anti-Semitism was covert during the Weimar Republic 1918-1933. to That was built upon by the Nazis and culminated in the Holocaust, costing the lives of six million Jews, men, women and one and a half million children. There were cases of Jewish Holocaust survivors who, following the end of the war, returned to their former homes in Poland and were set upon and killed by their one-time neighbours. Best known is the Kielce pogrom of July 4th, 1946, that cost the lives of 42 Jews, including a newborn baby and a pregnant woman. Despite the protestation of Poland's government today, there is no future for Jews in Poland, a country whose history of anti-Semitism extends to this day. The establishment of the Jewish state in 1948 was given as the reason to make economic life for Jews in North Africa and Middle Eastern Arab states impossible and 850,000 Jews had to flee their homes and became refugees without any international recognition. This month, Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, Gilad Erdan, has brought up the matter of this historic injustice with the Secretary of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Today, we have a strong state of Israel, a shield for all Jews who will not allow a repetition of state-sponsored persecution of Jews. Unfortunately, even in the year 2020, baseless hatred of Jews is still much in evidence all over Europe. Unbelievably voiced and acted out often with physical violence, even by people who have themselves been at the receiving end of cruel Nazi persecution. Having regard to this history of the repeated attempts to eliminate Jews and Judaism, its culture and belief, from the faith of the earth, Jews have one protector. Baruch Hashem, he has seen to it that the Jewish nation, even if depleted, always stood at the grave of its persecutors. Empires have come and gone, and so have republics and other regimes. But against all odds, we are here. Yet today, Jews face three great challenges, all beginning with A, anti-Semitism, assimilation and apathy. The first two are obvious, but apathy is equally important because it allows assimilation to happen. It is extremely sad that today Jews themselves are attempting to complete where others failed. Their innocuously appearing weapon is more dangerous than any gun. Intermarriage is happening throughout the Western world having reached a reported 70% in the United States. The Knesset Information and Research Center this month presented figures to the Immigration Absorption and Diaspora Committee of the Knesset, showing that 60% of European Jews has been lost to assimilation since World War II. Russia, where Jews seem to have a weak Jewish background, topped the chart with 75%. 
That is why they fall easy prey to Christian missionaries. But more about that a little later. The organization Yad Lachim, Hand to the Brothers, which stands in the forefront of the battle against assimilation and intermarriage in Israel, stated that the problem is exacting a huge toll in Israel. The assimilation numbers in Europe, terrible as they are, hide the fact that no less worrisome figures can be found right under our noses. To tell me more, I have with me in the studio Mr. Joaf Robinson, who manages the counter-assimilation department of Yad Lachim. Welcome and thank you very much for having taken the time to come in person during these difficult corona times. Thank you for inviting me. Estimates and survey results published by Yad Lachim state that the assimilation rate in Israel ranges between 8 and 10 percent. Are they this year's and how do you arrive at these figures? It's a very good question. The government of Israel requested in 2008 a survey being done on intermarriage in Israel. That survey was placed with the numbers of 5% intermarriage. When that figure came out, 5%, which relative to other parts of the world is low, living in a country that's mostly Jewish, that is a very high number. Since it was in 2008, and today we are almost 13 years afterwards, that number has grown. One of the problems with that number is that it did not take into consideration couples who were living together who could not marry by law because Israeli law states that only two people of the same religion can get married. There is no way to have a civil marriage in Israel. Those citizens who want to have a civil marriage have to fly abroad to get married. Couples who choose not to get married civilly abroad, they're not legally married, but they're living together. So that fact, together with the 13 years since, has given us the number between 8 to 10 percent. What form does this assimilation take? The assimilation in Israel has a few parts to it. In Israel, intermarriage causes a few problems. First of all, when the Soviet Union opened up its borders in the 1990s, the Knesset member Lieberman gave the number until today about 660,000 non-Jews who have right to make Aliyah move to Israel. That's because their grandfather on the father's side was Jewish. Right. The law in Israel states that even though they are not considered halachically Jewish... That's by Jewish law. The idea was that during the Holocaust, Hitler went back three generations to see who had a Jewish grandfather or grandmother. The state of Israel would do the same thing to allow these affiliated to Jewish family come to Israel and get their citizenship. But that really misfired, didn't it? Yes. And it's interesting, actually, because at the time, there was not really that much opposition. But Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, was deeply opposing it. Before the law was passed, was trying to convince ministers of the Israeli government to rethink because he foresaw the problems it might cause with assimilation and intermarriage. Apart from that, we also see assimilation coming through from foreign workers. So every year, thousands and thousands of workers from uh, Thailand, from the Philippines, from India, uh, many of them are in the medical industry. Local Israelis, whether it's men or women, have relationships with them and eventually get married. The assimilation also comes through the Arab and Muslim side. There are many, many cases of Jewish women who are converted to Islam and married here in Israel to Muslim men with some drastic results. We at Yad Achim actually have a whole department taking care of this assimilation through social workers and female psychologists. Are the numbers of marriages to Christians and Muslims more or less equal? Uh, it's a good question. It seems as the numbers are higher on the non-Jewish immigrants from Russia. There is more intermarriage happening there than with Muslims. However, we see every year hundreds and hundreds of cases of intermarriages with the Muslim community. So it's definitely something to watch out for. 
Leaving areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority aside, both Christian and Muslims are minorities in Israel. How do these relationships with Muslims develop? These relationships are 99.9% .9 between Muslim men, Jewish Israeli women. The reason it's only going through that one direction is because it would be a huge disgrace for her family if a Muslim woman dated a Jewish man and her life would be at risk. Keep it here, there's more. The Tamar Yona Show. Tamar? She's sassy. She's smart. She's funny. But she's also a real Jewish mother. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Did you know this psalm and many others were composed by a Jewish shepherd and musician who later became a king? Would you like to know some of the inner meanings of psalms to help you connect with God and strengthen your soul? An exciting and easy to read book is now available, which will help you do just that. Software for the Soul, Psalms for Everyone, available on Kindle, Audible, and Amazon.com. Software for the Soul. And now, here is Walter Bingham. In the last seven years of my work at Yad Le'achim, I've only treated three cases of Jewish men dating Muslim women. There's a few reasons. The way these relationships start between the Jewish women and the Muslim men is because in the Arab Muslim culture, it is forbidden to have relationship before marriage. And therefore, these young men who are aged 17, 18, 19, would describe themselves as secular Arabs, even though they uh, may be traditional in their Muslim observance, they are looking for a girlfriend. In their own community, that is forbidden. Every year, a few dozen Arab women get murdered just for the honor of the family because they disgrace this honor. So these young Arab men realize that in the Jewish-Israeli secular community, these relationships are allowed and are not frowned upon, and they go looking for that. They are also interested in hurting the Jewish people. They are pro-Palestinian, even if they are Israeli citizens, and they realize that bullets, knives, and fists are not doing the job. Well, what better way to hurt the Jewish people is by taking their daughters and marrying them and forcing them to convert to Islam. So where are the Jewish parents of these girls? A lot of times the parents are not aware of this relationship until it's very, very late. When they do become aware, they contact Yad Achim, our organization, and we give them the proper advice and we help them actually go through this. But many times it's already too late where she is psychologically, emotionally captive with this man. Why do we hear so little about this problem in the media? I think that, like many things in the Israeli media, it is oriented towards a certain perspective. And since I think a more left-wing political view and liberal view are the ones in the media, therefore they're not interested in bringing this subject up to discussion because it's very controversial. There are many people who get very upset if you tell them that you think that Jews should not marry non-Jews. Is there a government agency dealing with it? And what help do you get from the government? Currently in Israel, there is no government agency that is working against intermarriage and assimilation. However, the Israeli government has offices outside of Israel. The, the Sochnuta Yudit, the Jewish Federation, has uh, full campaigns in America, in Europe, in Canada, promoting Jews to get married with Jews because they realize how bad the situation is there. But in Israel, there is no office and we have no support at all. Yad Lachim is best known to act after the damage has been done, rescuing Jewish women from Muslim homes. How many successful rescues have you made? We have about 120 Jewish women and children that we rescue annually, 120 families. We get every day a few new cases. Is Not every case that is reported to us is a case that that woman is willing to leave her husband because of the abuse. It's a process. 
Can you disclose your modus operandi? Usually it starts off when a family member or the woman herself who's going through terrible abuse calls our 24-7 hotline. We get the information and we start to connect the woman or the family that has called to a social worker. Once we realize the situation, where she's located, the severity of the violence, then we make a plan how to go into that village or Arab town and bring out her and her children and take them to a safe house. We have a number of secret safe houses across Israel in different locations. And in those safe houses, these women start a new life. For the first year, they get full financial, emotional, psychological, if they need, support. And our goal is to help them become independent and stand on their own two feet. This operation must be very clandestine. Our security team that's in charge of the actual physical rescue all served in the IDF in elite commando units. They are all fluent in Arabic. They know the culture and customs and they know how to dress. Whenever there is a need, they will dress up as Arabs. They will play the part. Even we've had rescues from Gaza. What if there are children from such a union? The younger children are naturally more uh, connected and close to their mother. A lot of times these children themselves have gone through abuse from their father, and they are happily willing to leave and start a new life under their Jewish identity. And we take them together with their mother. It's only the older kids in their teens and the older who have already identified themselves as Muslims who do not want to leave. Actually, part of my job is to contact these young adults, 16 and up, and offer them an opportunity to search and find out what their Jewish heritage is. Hopefully, they will accept this invitation and research their Jewish identity. Is there any way that you can prevent early friendships to stop it reaching the point of no return when the girl's love is irreversible? The majority of these girls, these young women, are going into these relationships, which are devastating in the future for them, came from troubled backgrounds. So they have broken homes, sometimes with no father. Some of them have experienced abuse in their childhood. The way we try to prevent this is we have social workers who go every day to different schools across Israel and give lectures to young women educating them of the problems and difficulties that may arise from this kind of relationship. I heard that some of these girls from broken homes spend a lot of time in malls, and that is where a lot of the Arab young men try to find them. Do you send anyone into those areas where that happens? So sometimes what we do is when we feel like there's a, there's a certain place when there's a lot of intermingling, we might send a social worker there with some flyers to pass out, to talk to the girls, to try to explain to them the danger that's coming. And we work also a lot with the social media, especially now during the time of Corona, where most people cannot meet. We have many, many advertisements on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok. These are places where young adults are visiting, and we are able to pass this message through these platforms. Do you get any results from that? Yes, we find that we have a lot of people who are following us, and we hear stories of girls, of young women, who, because they watched an advertisement or they saw a video of a woman speaking about her past life experience, this woke them up to realize that this relationship that they're in is not a good and healthy relationship, and they went and ended it. So yes, we definitely get good results from it, but it's all about also the community. If the community was more aware of where a child is and what their life is like and how open their relationship is with their parents, because a lot of times this could be prevented if the parents had an open, communicative relationship with their children and the children felt love in the house. Does it happen with children from Orthodox communities? Yes. Sadly to say, we find this happening within the Orthodox and within the modern Orthodox religious communities as well. In the last few years, we see that the numbers are actually going up in those communities, whereas in the secular community, it's actually going down. That's extremely surprising. Why in Torah-observant families, where the movement of unmarried girls is fairly strictly monitored? Because there is less talk about it. Um, in the religious Orthodox communities, it's not allowed really to speak about this subject. And because of that, 
families are not aware that their children, their, their younger girls, might be in danger. You are painting a very gloomy picture. So all I can say to end is, may Hashem bless Yad Lachim's holy work so that this situation can be eradicated. Yoav Robinson, thank you, and I very much appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And now an academic investigation into the subject. According to a report researched and compiled by Professor Sergio de la Pergola of the London-based Institute for Jewish Policy Research and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, the number of European Jews is declining due to assimilation. According to a report researched and compiled by Professor Sergio de la Pergola of the London-based Institute for Jewish Policy Research, and Hebrew University in Jerusalem, the number of European Jews is declining due to assimilation. To help me understand that a little better, I am pleased to welcome via Zoom Professor De La Pergola. Good to have your expertise, sir. Welcome. Hello. Nice to be here. Now, what period does this report cover? This report covers essentially the contemporary period, and it is largely based on a study undertaken in 2018 with the help of the European Union's Center for Fundamental Rights, which is in fact devoted to the study of anti-Semitism, racism, and discrimination. But in the framework of such a survey, we also collected data on broader characteristics of the Jews in 12 European Union countries, And we have significantly used this data to present this report. However, the report also has an historical background. And so we start very broadly from the Middle Ages with the Jewish traveler Benjamin of Tudela, the very famous Jew who did a sort of census of the Jews in the world known at that time, that is in the year 1170, the 12th century. And then we compare the more recent data for the 19th and the early 20th century and the unfortunate impact of the Shoah and finally the contemporary period. Uh Uh, Looking at that, uh, of course, the number of Jews in Europe is uh, far higher than during the Middle Ages. But the interesting thing is that the percentage of Jews in Europe out of the total in the world is basically the same. It has grown enormously since the Middle Ages through the 19th and early 20th century, from what it was basically less than 10% in the earlier period to approximately more than 80% of world Jewry. But then, due to two factors, the Shoah, the Holocaust, and there's massive international migration, Assimilation is a very wide-ranging term. It covers intermarriage, conversion by missionaries, leaving the religious family tradition, even living in a totally non-Jewish environment and more. Do you make any similar distinction? And if so, can you expand? Uh, Yes, in fact, we use uh, data on intermarriage and we have also data on religiosity, on affiliation to Jewish communities. To be true, the data are a little bit contradictory. Here, why after the break? In a time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Local Hitman airs every Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. North American Time, 7 a.m. Israeli Time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. And now, here is Walter Bingham. Assimilation is a very wide-ranging term. It covers intermarriage, conversion by missionaries, leaving the religious family tradition, 
even living in a totally non-Jewish environment and more. Do you make any similar distinction? And if so, can you expand? Uh, yes. In fact, we use uh, data on intermarriage and we have also data on religiosity, on affiliation to Jewish communities. To be true, the data are a little bit contradictory because, in fact, the growing integration of Jews in the context of the host society, in the context of the majority, has brought to more frequent contact at school, in the workplace, and through uh, marriages. And in fact, the proportion of intermarriages is very high. However, it is very different across the different countries of Europe. And we have data on intermarriage, and there are data also the amount of participation of Jews in Jewish community life. Uh -huh. The report mentions a thousand year low. Do you have any comparative figures for earlier years? It's not a thousand years low. It's a low proportion, but the number is high. But what is uh, significant now looking at the present is that, in fact, since World War II, but especially since uh, the 1970s, the number of Jews in Europe, if we take the whole of Europe, has diminished. The main factor is the immigration from the former Soviet Union, which had very significant Jewish population in the millions. Most of the Jews have left the former Soviet Union, and there are just a few hundred thousands left, and most of them have left Europe. They have gone to Israel primarily, and the second place to the United States and to some extent other countries, although a large contingent has stopped in Germany, whose Jewish population has grown as a consequence of immigration from the former Soviet Union. Is assimilation similar all over Europe, or is there a noteworthy difference between countries? There are notable differences. Uh, accumulation traditionally in, in Eastern Europe, not speaking of the past, the post-Shoah. However, there are other countries with significant uh, religious Jewish communities. One is Belgium and the United Kingdom. And so those are the two countries, along with Austria, who have the, and, and to some extent France, who have the lower percentages of intermarriage. And elsewhere, the percentages are much higher. What's the current percentage of the decline per Jewish population? And do you distinguish between assimilation and emigration? You mentioned some of that already. These are two very different things. Assimilation is an internal process, which means people are less interested, really, some of them, to stop considering themselves Jewish. And this has happened in history. Of course, emigration means uh, leaving the, the region totally. It does not mean disappearing Jewishly. It means moving elsewhere. Sometimes elsewhere uh, may offer better conditions to active Jewish life. Is this decline continuous? And what part does antisemitism play? There are interesting differences, uh, not only between countries, but also uh, between generations. And what we find, and this is in a sense good news, is the uh, higher proportion of the religious uh, within the Jewish population. In fact, the level of assimilation seems somewhat lower among younger people in Europe. That is, those below the age of 50 have lower percentages of intermarriage than those above age 50. This is an interesting finding, somewhat reversed. It may be explained by the fact that younger families are more religious. The proportion religious among the younger generation is higher uh -huh. than among the elderly. This is due by the fact they have more children. And so more children means uh, later on more young adults and uh, a growing share within the total Jewish populations. We also find a return to the community on the side of some uh, who had uh, literally abandoned the community, they were no more interested, they lived at the periphery. And now they tend to be kind of coming back and uh, showing a greater degree of interest. What's the reason? Now, the reason is that sometimes people react returning to Judaism against the anti-Semitic pressures that they perceive around them. It is a very sad fact that anti-Semitism has been growing in Europe. And this is perceived by Jews in every country. Everybody reports an increase in anti-Semitism in their societies. So this is a very disturbing factor, which affects some sense of return toward the center of the community. 
And among some, the desire to leave altogether the country of residence and move to another country or to another continent. So anti-Semitism, in fact, produces two different and opposed effects. One is leaving altogether. The other one is returning somewhat closer to the organized Jewish community. You said that there was different percentages of assimilation in different countries. So which one has the lowest assimilation? And would that mean that this is where Judaism and Jewish tradition is upheld most? Or does it mean that there is a basic non-Jewish atmosphere to start with in the countries in which there is the least assimilation? First of all, assimilation is related to the Jewish characteristics uh, you have. You have had uh, a more Jewish family, a greater amount of Jewish education, uh, greater opportunities to be a member of an organized community. And so these are factors that tend to prevent assimilation. In any case, there is a correlation between the intensity of your Jewish environment and the tendency to disperse, uh, to meet others and to integrate into a non-Jewish environment. Of course, there are different countries. In some countries, the role of religion is stronger. In some other countries, the role of religion is weaker. And I would say that in Northern Europe and Eastern Europe, societies are more secularized or secular. So also the Jewish communities are more secular. So they are more assimilated in terms of having more frequent relations with non-Jews. In countries such as the Mediterranean area, let's say Spain, France, Italy, but also Belgium and the United Kingdom, the role of religion is stronger, maybe different, but it is perceived as more important. And this is something that may keep the Jewish community closer to the synagogue and to a religious life, and therefore show lower rate of intermarriage. You said that in some parts of Europe, people are more secular. That's right. What is replacing the concept of God? Well, it's nation. And or a concept of culture, that is something which is tied to family and genealogy and parents and backgrounds and, and habits and inheritance that still very relevant for many. And otherwise, it's what we call ethnicity, that is a secular concept of what a group means. One important example is the, the former Soviet Union, where religion was basically annulled or forbidden. And uh, the Jews were recognizing themselves as a nation, as a people, as a nationhood. The truth is that uh, in the state of Israel, too, the majority of the population is quite secular. And this means, uh, however, that there is a very strong national identity as Jews uh, in the state of Israel, as as in fact uh, there was in certain parts of Europe. So the secularization means uh, moving from God and religion to ethnicity and then a kind of cultural residue. People who say even uh, nation and and ethnicity are not very relevant these days of universalism and individualism. But what is interesting is Jewish culture. So we have certain concepts, uh, certain books and texts that still speak to us. You spoke about Israel and that uh, here also most of the population are secular. That's so at the moment. But isn't it likely to change with the strengthening of the ultra-Orthodox? Oh, yes, definitely. The demography has a very powerful role. And through the, the different birth rate and higher fertility and larger family size, the Orthodox as a group has been growing and they are projected to grow significantly in the future. And so the overall composition of Israeli society is going to change. Incidentally, Israel received a huge input of immigrants from the former Soviet Union, most of whom were quite secular. But now we cannot see on the horizon significant waves of immigration to Israel. And so what counts more is the internal dynamics of those who already live here. Of course, I'm speaking from Jerusalem. And we see, therefore, that the proportion Orthodox will increase definitely in the future tens of years. One interesting thing in our survey is the loyalty of the European Jews to the idea of Europe. And one question was, do you feel European? And the percentage of Jews who answered affirmatively, yes, we feel part of Europe. We believe Europe is a good thing. Among Jews is higher than among the general population. The general population is apparently these days less convinced of the usefulness of the European Union than are the Jews. So this this is an interesting point of view. Of course, there will be those who will say that the real thing that counts are the nations 
and not the European Union. And so they are more nationalist than, than unionist. The Jewish point of view, though, is that it is important to pertain to a large political power, the European Union. In spite of all, Europe has also a visible contribution of immigrants from Israel. There are about 70,000 Israelis recorded within the European Union, which is a significant minor but important proportion of, of the total, especially among children. So there are these mutual exchanges that have to be kept in mind. In, in other words, demography is not static. And likewise, identity is not static. There are changes, and these changes are very much affected by what happens around us. Finally, what's your prognosis? How far will this assimilation go? And you mentioned the affinity of Jews to Europe. Is there a future for Jews in Europe? Or does apathy lead to self-destruct? In our report, we answer very clearly to this question. The, our response is this, whatever will happen to Europe, this will define the destiny of the Jews. The future of Europe, honestly, I cannot say is very clear. So if Europe can conglomerate into a stable, peaceful, open, transparent society, tolerant above all, then there is uh, room for minorities and for differences, including uh, Jews as a group, as an individuals. If Europe uh, cannot achieve those goals, it becomes a conglomerate of style uh, national countries, each one closed uh, within itself. Then the, the mental space, the moral space and the social space of the Jews will be reduced significantly. And so the, the answer is wherever Europe goes, there the Jews will go. Professor Della Pergola, thank you, and I appreciate your time. My pleasure. From Israel's Ministry of Diaspora Affairs, I welcome by Zoom Mr. Yogev Karasenti, who is the minister for this department. Your ministry is concerned with cooperating with Jewry in the diaspora, but in recent decades, there has again developed a strong tendency among diaspora Jewry to assimilate through, for instance, intermarriage and, where possible, even denial of Jewish connections. My question is this. Does anti-Semitism play a significant part in promoting this rather disquieting desire to assimilate, or are other factors more decisive? Thank you very much for this question. The mission of the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs is to make sure that Communal Jewish life in Jews in the diaspora can feel can live a full and thriving Jewish life. Antisemitism actually plays different roles in different areas of the world. The connection between antisemitism and assimilation, as we see it, is and from a person to person. That's also uh, has to be said for those with a strong Jewish identity. Apologies for this fault in the Zoom transmission. Antisemitism many times push them to the center, makes them more likely to make Aliyah to Israel, for example. If they cannot live freely as Jews in a certain place, they leave that place and go to where they can live their Jewish life to their highest level. For example, they make Aliyah to Israel. But for those with a weaker Jewish identity, for those, uh, let's say, with a choice whether to live Jewish life or to identify as Jews or not, it can have uh, different outcomes. For those people, for example, if they see that they pay very high price for being Jewish or being identified as Jews, they might choose not to identify as Jews. And then the road from there to assimilation, of course, might be shorter. In other areas of the world, yeah. Anti-Semitism can push people with, let's say, a weak Jewish identity to Israel, and there they might be more likely to marry Jews, talking about Eastern Europe, when the economical situation is worse than what they can get in Israel, then their push factors to Israel that uh -huh. can be anti-Semitism and the economy as well, might be strong enough to make young people make Aliyah. And once they live in Israel, the probability that they would marry non-Jew is, of course, uh, decreasing in a very high uh, percentage because in Israel, most of their socioeconomic milieu, socioeconomic group would be Jewish as well, probably halachically Jewish. And if not halachically Jewish, then of culturally Jewish. 
and then they are more likely to to marry Jews. So I'm glad I'm glad you said culturally Jewish because there's this large contingent of Eastern European Jews who are not halachically Jewish, and in many cases not even culturally Jewish. Even if they are not halachically Jewish and, and they come to Israel as the law of return allows and wishes them to do, in Israel. I believe that uh, within a generation or two, they would assimilate into the Jewish community, whether it would be a secular Jew or religious Jew, but they'll be part of the entire Jewish community, and they'll be just like any other Israeli. In France, for instance, we see, of course, that anti-Semitism did generate Aliyah. But I am not quite clear about assimilation in the diaspora. You've explained quite well, but still there seems to be this large element of people who just don't want to have anything to do with Judaism. But for this group, many times, if they keep a certain aspect of Jewishness, may it be a Jewish family name or any a Jewish custom, and then they are suffering because of it. So sometimes anti-Semitism might even push them back to the Jewish people. I just remind you the Herzl He was an assimilating Jew until he saw that uh, there is no uh, future in uh, assimilation. And then he came to the conclusion that the Jews need a state of their own. Antisemitism can play different roles in different uh, eras and in different geographic locations. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you one thing about the French Jews. Once antisemitism broke in its latest uh, big wave several years ago, we saw a big migration of Jews from uh, France. Some of them migrated to Israel. Some of them migrated to the UK, but also uh, many of them migrated to Canada. Antisemitism pushed them in different directions. Those with a strong Jewish commitment moved to Israel. Those who wanted to stay closer to uh, their businesses or to live in European atmosphere uh, moved to the UK. And some moved to Canada because that's another uh, French-speaking country. There is no one uh, direction to antisemitism. Of course, when anti-Semitism reaches a certain level that it risks Jews, then it's a whole different mechanism that threatens uh, Jews, and then things are not continuing in the same trend as, as before. I don't want it to be heard as if I think that anti-Semitism has only positive effect on uh, assimilation. I think uh, anti-Semitism is a very serious problem that many times causes assimilation, because at least the group of Jews that have today the choice whether to be Jews or not, because of the numbers that uh, you describe of 70% in the United States. Yeah, so today, more than ever in history, I think, uh, there are Jews that can choose whether to identify uh, as Jews or not. And of course, anti-Semitism, if it makes the price of this identification high, it brings to assimilation and not making them closer to, to their Jewish tradition or to the state of Israel. Because if they're simply paying a very high price for their Jewish identity, then many of them simply decide to get rid of it or not to practice it until, without even deciding, it's becoming a redundant part of one's identity. Minister Yogev Karasenti, thank you very much for coming on the program, and I appreciate your time. And Chanukah Sameach, thank you very much. Toda rabba, Chanukah Sameach. I mentioned missionaries. Well, they have every trick in the book. Now they are selling mezuzot. Not only are the cases empty, but they are decorated with Christian symbols in addition to the traditional signs. Yad Lachim recently received photographic proof of that fraud. While they profess to believe in God, they are causing innocent people, mainly Russians, to commit sins. Thus is the sincerity of missionaries. A rabbi who is active in the north with the Russian-speaking public and who is in constant contact with Yad Lachim's counter-missionary department, saw a mezuzah at a large club for the elderly that attracted his attention. It was on the wrong side of the door, and it bore the symbol of the Messianic Jews' cult. After receiving permission from the director of the club, he took it down to check its content and was shocked to discover that it was empty. He quickly replaced it with the kosher mezuzah that he had in his briefcase. 
Although I have researched, spoken, and written about the activities of missionary groups in Israel, one question remains unanswered. Why are these organizations receiving residency in the Jewish state to freely ply their Christian doctrine to gullible Jews with the support of the Jewish agency? In a future program, I shall tell you about that inexplicable Jewish assistance to assimilation. Only recently, the self-styled Bishop of Israel, Glenn Plummer, and his wife Pauline, who calls herself the First Lady of Israel, have moved from Detroit to Mavaseret Zion near Jerusalem, a hotbed of missionary activity. Plummer who is prominent in the Church of God in Christ, announced on their website that he is opening a media institute in Israel for, listen to it, African-American students, and our government is falling for this scam. The Israel Allies Foundation places him in ninth place of the 50 most influential Christian allies. The concept of free speech as practiced in the Western world, is an admirable one. It does, however, have limits to protect the safe operation of the nation-state and its citizens. That's why anti-Semitic hate speech is prohibited by law in many countries, or at least publicly denounced. The leader of the British Labour Party has been expelled from his party for anti-Jewish pronouncements. At the paradigm of free speech... Hyde Park Corner in London. Police patrol monitor the language used. Germany has strict laws banning Holocaust denial and in the US acts of anti-Semitism are heavily punished. Thus, free speech to hurt the unity and national principles of the country is heavily curtailed. What does Israel want to prove? by allowing widespread, overt and covert Christian missionaries to get an ever firmer foothold in the country. Whilst I respect the private religious practice and belief of our Christian friends and supporters, residency in and visits to our country for the purpose of proselytizing cannot be defended under the concept of democracy. Visitors found to contravene this should be immediately expelled. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines democracy as government by the people, especially rule by the majority. And according to the concise Oxford Dictionary, it is a government in which the people have a voice through the exercise of power. I believe that if there were a referendum on the subject of officially allowing Christian missionizing here in Israel, it would be heavily defeated. Unfortunately, in Israel, the people have no power because the members of Knesset, our parliament, are delegates of their respective parties and not representatives voted for by the, of course, wrongly named electorate. You usually vote for one or two policies published by a party, but at the same time have to accept some of their policies with which you do not agree, and you have no free access to members of Knesset. Let me give you an example. A few days ago, I wrote to the office of Minister Elkin with a request to get his comment for this program on the matter of his recommendation of Efi Etam as head of Yad Vashem. At the time of posting the program, I have not even had an acknowledgement. And with that, I've come to the end of the program. I look forward to receiving your comments either on email to walter at israelnewstalkradio, one word, dot com, where you will always get my personal reply, or comment on the Walter Bingham file page on our website. I wish all my Jewish listeners a happy Hanukkah and hope to be back again once more before the end of the year. But if not, I send greetings to all my non-Jewish friends. Have a wonderful holiday season with God's blessing for good health. Goodbye from the holy city of Jerusalem where it's a free local call to the Almighty.
where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips. With scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from League City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Frank Norris from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. 